Oktoberfest, that glorious time of year where thousands of tourists descend upon Munich, Germany and make drunken fools of themselves while wearing ill-fitted lederhosen. But not this year. Yes, for only the 25th time in 210 years, Oktoberfest ist abgesagt. Cancelled. But I had no plan to go to Munich anyway, so it doesn't really put much of a damper on my plans. Instead, I'm going to be celebrating Oktoberfest here at home by making one of the festival's star snacks, the pretzel. This time on Tasting History. The first Oktoberfest celebration was held in 1810 to honor the marriage of Bavarian Crown Prince Ludwig to the Saxon Hildburghausen Princess Theresa. That year, the main event was a horse race, which became the reason for the yearly celebration. But as time went on, the focus shifted more toward food and beer, so much so that in 1896, what had been little scattered beer stalls were replaced by massive beer halls. The beer then, and still today, has to be brewed in Munich and has to live up to the Reinheitsgebot, or German Beer Purity Law of 1516. Now, I don't know if mine lives up to the Reinheitsgebot, but, um, it's the Oktoberfest Märzen, Polina. Yes! Yes! Uh, standards that strictly adhere to the Reinheitsgebot using only four ingredients, water, hops, yeast, and malt for nearly 400 years. How's about that? So, you know, I am Reinheitsgebot compliant, even here in California. But regardless if your beer is Reinheitsgebot compliant or not, nothing will accompany it better than a pretzel. And that's what we're making today. Now, today's recipe comes from the 1581 Ein Neu Kochbuch or A New Cookbook by Max Rumpelt. Kind of a misleading name now, 440 years later, but uh, I guess it was new when it came out. Anyway, Prezzedella. Take fair flour, egg yolk, and a little wine, sugar, and anise, and make a dough with it. With clean hands, roll it nicely long and rounded, and make little pretzels. Place in a warm oven and bake, not burning it, but until they are well dried so they are crisp and good. You may or may not use cinnamon and it is called prezzedella. Now this is going to be very different from the traditional Bavarian pretzel that we're used to that would be served at Oktoberfest today. First of all, it's not going to be soft and springy because it's not leavened. It's going to be probably more like a cookie or a biscuit and, and crumbly. In fact, the recipe even said that it should be crisp after baking. Also, it has some really interesting ingredients like anise and cinnamon, if you want, and wine. I mean, that's just weird. Clearly I did not think this through because I just opened this beer and now I'm about to open a bottle of wine as well and I'm gonna have both to contend with. But in the words of Heinrich Heine, ich krolle nicht. I shan't complain. Now on with the recipe. What you'll need is two and a half cups or 300 grams of flour, four to five large egg yolks, one third cup or 80 milliliters of wine, now the recipe doesn't specify what kind of wine. Um, I would probably steer away from a red wine. I'd go with a white. I went with a Riesling um, that's actually, it's not too, too sweet, but it is sweeter than most of your white wines. So, you know, cause it's supposed to be a sweet dish, but go with whatever you want. Three quarters cup or 150 grams of sugar, a half teaspoon ground aniseed, a half teaspoon ground cinnamon. Now that's optional according to the recipe and a half teaspoon of salt. Now, some of you are probably saying, but Max, where is the lie? And tis no lie, there is no lie in this pretzel. Now, the pretzels that we think of today and the ones that would actually be served at Oktoberfest are called Laugenbretzeln, or lye pretzels. And that's because they're dipped in a diluted but still caustic lye solution before being baked. And that's what gives it the wonderful dark color and that sheen on the outside, as well as contributes to the taste. But for all that we know, they haven't changed in, in hundreds of years. It's a very simple recipe and they, they really haven't changed. So seeing as this is all about making historic foods and tasting something a little different, I figured if you want to see what a Laugenbretzeln tasted like 200 years ago, just go get one today. So I'm going with a recipe from Mainz, Germany, just up the road, like 100 miles, I think, for the Pretzedella or the sweeter pretzels. So the first thing to do is preheat your oven to 350 degrees Fahrenheit or 180 degrees Celsius. Then add your flour to a medium bowl and whisk in the aniseed, cinnamon, and salt. Then in a separate bowl, beat the eggs and sugar until they are as pale as I am in the middle of winter. Then add in the wine and mix until incorporated. 
finally, a third at a time, add in the dry ingredients and mix in gently just until there are no streaks remaining. At this point, the dough should be fairly workable. Now, if it's too sticky to work with, just add a little bit more flour, one tablespoon at a time, until it becomes a consistency that you think you're going to be able to roll into pretzels. Then, with clean hands, per the recipe's instructions, take a piece of dough and roll it out until it's a nice long rope. Now, the recipe is not specific in how thin to roll the dough, but I can tell you right now, because we didn't work any gluten, there's not going to be a lot of stretch to this dough, so it will break if you get it too thin. So, just kind of play with it, but not too thin. Once the dough is rolled out, though, it's time to shape your pretzels. Again, the recipe is not specific in how big the pretzels are going to be. It says little pretzels, but is that big? Eh, who knows? You know, a Logan pretzel can be like this big, so anything is smaller than that. Um, but I ended up making about six or seven, um, I think I made like six decent sized pretzels with this, simply because any thinner and my dough broke. So take the rope of dough and form a U shape. Then cross one end over the other and give it one more little twist. Then make sure the main part of the pretzel is nice and round. Then fold the twisted ends over and press the tips down very gently. Then place it onto a lined baking sheet and repeat. Now, these pretzels are going to turn out with a dull finish, and that's okay. But if you want to add an egg wash using egg yolk at this point, go right ahead. It'll give them a little bit of a sheen. Um, it just looks nicer, and egg is already in the recipe, so it's not going to affect the flavor at all. Now, once the pretzadella are shaped, pop them in the oven for 12 to 15 minutes while we look at the history of pretzels. So the story goes that in the year 610, an Italian monk was teaching little children how to say their prayers for Lent. And when they would do well, he would give them a little treat. It was a piece of bread that he would roll and twist into the shape. It was supposed to be the shape of the children's arms folded over uh, as if they were praying. And he called them little rewards or pretiola. Wonderful story. So sweet. So nice. So probably not true. First of all, while not impossible, the very specific date of 610 AD makes me a little dubious of this story because in the 7th century, monks were writing down, you know, weddings of royalty or the death of a king or chronicling a battle, but they weren't writing down the, the creation of a bread product very often. Uh, so that very specific date makes me, makes me a little dubious. Also, there are places in southern France that claim the exact same story or something very similar. And in Germany, they claim they made them and named them bracelos, uh, which means bracelet in Latin. So, yeah. And more recently, historians believe that the twisted bread was actually probably around as far back as when the Celts were still in Central Europe. And then the Catholic Church in the Middle Ages just took them and gave them a nice little backstory. The medieval Catholic Church taking pagan things and converting them to fit into Christianity? Doesn't seem like something they would have done, but I suppose it's possible. But regardless of where pretzels got their start, we do know that they were quite popular in and around modern-day Germany by the 12th century, where in 1111 they began to appear on the emblems of bakers' guilds. Then in 1185 we have the earliest depiction of the knotted baked good in an Alsatian encyclopedia called the Hortus Deliciarum, or Garden of Delights. A document more notable for being the first encyclopedia compiled by a woman, Herod of Landsberg. What's interesting to me is the rather anachronistic placement of the pretzel in Herod's work, where it's sitting on Queen Esther's dinner table from the Bible. And while this may be the bread's first official link to religious symbolism, it is just the beginning of pretzels getting all knotted up with Christianity. See, while there is no direct evidence for that lovely monk-making pretzel story, we do know that by the Middle Ages, pretzels had become very popular as a Lenten food, or a food served during Lent, because they were so simple. Uh, it was just flour, salt, water, and sometimes yeast, and sometimes not. It was a perfect dish for those 40 days of fasting before Easter. Additionally, the fact that its distinct shape left three holes in one pretzel made for an easy way for the medieval church to describe that holy trinity, which they were always having trouble explaining to people. Most famously, St. Patrick likened it to the three leaves on a single clover. Though I think that I prefer the pretzel analogy. 
And it seems that the Catholic Church was actually a really good publicist for pretzels, because other than giving them a really cool origin story, they also began splashing them all over the pages of prayer books, where St. Bartholomew was often depicted surrounded by a wreath of pretzels. Saint or no, that man loved his carbs. And it's probably those religious tie-ins that help pretzels make their way into the holiday traditions of many German-speaking countries. At Christmas, people would dangle them from their Tenenbaum like tasteful ornaments, and then at New Year's, children would hang them around their necks as a good luck charm, something that's still practiced in parts of Germany today. And by Easter, parents were hiding pretzels in and around the house, kind of as a sort of pre-Easter egg hunt tradition. And frankly, I think I would prefer pretzels to hard-boiled eggs. Though I do wonder if they were trying to use the same pretzels for all three holidays, because I don't really think those Christmas pretzels are going to make it to Easter. But it wasn't all fun and games for pretzels. They played their part in some very serious historical events as well. Namely, in 1529, when the city of Vienna, Austria was under siege by the Ottomans, led by Suleiman the Magnificent. So the story goes that the Ottomans were digging tunnels to undermine the city's walls, but some monks who were in the basement of their monastery baking pretzels heard the scratching of the pickaxes. They raised the alarm and alerted the famous Imperial Landsknechte, who stopped the enemy before they could break through, saving the city. And as a reward, the pretzel-baking monks were given an official coat of arms by the Habsburg Emperor Charles V. Wonderful story, but also probably not true. But I don't really mind that, because while it's probably not true, it's surrounded by true events. And that's one thing that I love about these little stories in history. I go searching for pretzel history, and instead I spend four hours learning about the Siege of Vienna, which I didn't know that much about. And I love that I can just kind of fall down these little historical rabbit holes. And that is why I am so proud to be sponsored today by Curiosity Stream, a never-ending rabbit hole of learning. Curiosity Stream allows you to stream thousands of documentaries on everything from nature to travel, technology, and of course, food and history. You can watch on your phone or your smart TV or on your computer as I used to do back at my old job where I always had Curiosity Stream playing on one of my monitors. Not that I encourage that sort of behavior while you're at work. So if you are curious about CuriosityStream, you can sign up using the link in the description with the code TASTINGHISTORY to get an entire year for just $14.99. $14.99? That's only about 200 years before the pretzel made its way to America. Now we don't have an exact year for pretzel's debut in the New World, but it was probably around the year 1700 when an influx of German immigrants came in to settle Pennsylvania. But pretzels basically stayed the same until 1861, when they got a new twist. Julius Sturgis in Littitz, Pennsylvania opened America's first commercial pretzel bakery. Soon after, he developed the American hard pretzel. And they were great because they lasted a lot longer and he could ship them further away. Now, many people give him full credit for having the first hard pretzel, but as we've seen in our recipe today, that is not quite so, because our pretzel should be nice and crisp and about ready to take out of the oven. So start checking your pretzels around 12 minutes, but it might take a little bit longer. Uh, you just want to have them kind of dried out on top and browning just a little bit around the edges. Then take them out and set them on a wire rack to cool. And here we are, our 16th century Bretzeln Pretzedella. So yeah, here it is. It's lovely. It's, I, I actually ended up doing the egg wash on some and, and not on others. I definitely like the egg wash. I also sprinkled a little extra uh, cinnamon on top just because uh, it looked good and why not. Um, I'd say that's crispy. Um, let's give it a shot. They're also kind of crumbly though, so. These pretzels are making me thirsty. Seinfeld shout out for anyone who watches Seinfeld. All right, so full transparency here. I'm not really a fan. Um, namely because they have aniseed in them. I don't like aniseed, so why would I think I would be a fan? <laughs> um, I need a lot more sugar. Um, I just don't like that, that flavor all that much. Um, and it's not like overwhelmingly anise flavored. They're just, there's that flavor, and I, and I just don't really, really care for that. The texture is interesting. It's almost like, almost like shortbread, except a little softer. Like they, they don't crumble quite as much as shortbread. Um, but 
the, the texture actually I don't mind, though they, they did make me thirsty, uh, legitimately. I, I do think that if I was going to make these, I would just leave out the aniseed and put maybe some extra sugar and maybe ginger in them, and then they would be delicious. Uh, so, you know, I think that you can play around and, and, you know, do some different flavors. But other than the shape of a pretzel, there's nothing about this that screams pretzel in the flavor. But if you think about, like, those Dutch butter cookies that are in pretzel shape, there's nothing about that that says pretzel other than shape either. So really, it's just the shape. And, and that's okay, because it was fun to, to make it. I, I learned how to do that. I'd never done it before. Um, and it wasn't as hard as I thought it would be. Anyway, regardless of what you're doing for Oktoberfest, I hope that you have a beer, have a pretzel, or just enjoy Oktoberfest however you like, and I will see you next time on Tasting History.